start by asking a question. I always ask questions. And have you ever wondered what the people of today, the youths, the people at s in, in schools are absorbing? All these little bits they, they pick up from different places, you know, home, school, so if it's either workplace or anywhere they might having contact. Well, today I'll give you a little idea of it. This question takes us back to 1802, during the separation of church and state. Um, uh, then later was the famous fundamentalist movement. It's when the church gave up its position as the highest archy to secular teaching, to secular governments. And yes, God did get out of our governments. God did get out of our schools, maybe workplaces, our, our, um, uh, our society. And yes, now, now we're here. Everything has been given up to secular teaching. And um, uh, people have the wrong idea of, you know, church, Bible, and love. People think that Love requires affirmation. Basically, if you don't agree with everything I say, you don't love me. It, that doesn't even work vice versa. If you do agree with everything I say, you love me. But it doesn't, why does everything have to do with desire, politics, and money? If people want it, okay, let's do it. Even the European Psychological Association has become Many people left it because it has become such a political lobby. Since just a few decades ago, they didn't want, they didn't um, uh, state through scientific breakthroughs anymore. They wanted to go by political agenda. And uh, they, lo they, lo they no longer wanted to say, for example, that um, homosexuality is a psychological disorder. They don't want to say that anymore. Now it's everything which goes against it is a psychological disorder. They went from one thing, from being a disorder to something being a, from anything against it being a disorder. And this is all through politics and you know, a bunch of funds and money, who knows? And um, uh, not long ago, well, decades ago actually, they, so, some psychiatrists figured out that the suicide rates of um, transgender people is 20 times higher after their first operation to look differently. And it's, they think that it's all this idea of being a different person that is making people think certain things and do certain things, which are dangerous, harmful to not just themselves, but also to other people. So they've concluded that it is but through political agenda, it isn't. It's correct, but politically incorrect. Like, um, uh, if we had to look at Corinthians 12, Corinthians 6, 12. It's like um, uh, sexual immorality. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not 
be, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach, stomach for the food. But God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but the Lord and and but the Lord and the Lord of the bo- of the body. This is the power of God raised. This is the power of God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? I think this explains itself perfectly. Um, uh, it's 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 basically like um, it's like I had to say anorexia. You, you know, like if if I say that I'm if I'm actually 40 kilos, and I think that I'm overweight, then I, I'm it's it's this thought that I'm overweight, which makes it a disorder. That's a, it's a disorder, and. Um, the, the truth is that I'm 40 kilos and I must be much more than that. So, yes, they move on to the next thing. You know, it's just gender identity. Then they declassify it as mental illness and started to follow public opinion. And uh, now we have things like homophobia or transphobia. And as I said earlier, they went from something being a disorder to anything against it is a disorder. Um, uh, basically, they're saying, you know, that our Christian worldview is a disorder. Make no mistake. That's what they're basically saying. That, you know, shut up. You could put people on TV which are smart and which could say things against you. Um, uh, the, this is postmodernism. That's what it is. It's when people want to abuse of power and do whatever they want with it. Um, uh, and all these laws aren't going to you know, be these really extreme laws which are going to look weird and people would, wouldn't want to follow them. They're going to look good. People would want to follow them. People, people would, would think that they make sense. But we know that scripture in Matthew 25, the goats and the sheep, you know, by their fruit, we would recognize them. Um, uh, they're, they're not going to be these extreme laws, you know, they're going to be these little laws. Some of them are going to be meant to confuse us in order to follow them. And um, in many, many atheists argue that nothing seems to have essence anymore, nothing seems to have meaning anymore, and everything is the famous illusion. People think that some atheists in some certain corners think that uh, that consciousness is an illusion. Some people wonder, were they conscious while they were saying that? <laughs> it's like uh, it's contradictory. Even marriage has lost its essence. People forgot Corinthians seven. I'm not talking about people out there. I'm talking about even churches forgetting the concept of marriage, Corinthians seven, and. Uh, People no longer seem to care about facts, objective ones. They think they could create this figure of themselves. And then it's an offense if you say anything against them. The Christian has to defend himself now. Um, uh, in Let me give you a, an illustration of how we would be. Um, uh, I think we, we are familiar with the scripture in Matthew 27 when Pilate gave Jesus over to be crucified. Why? Because he wanted to satisfy the crowd. Um, he said, you know, I am innocent of this man's body. It's your responsibility. You know, he wanted to get, he, he wanted to satisfy the crowd and give Jesus to them. That is how. That is like a, a really good illustration of how we are going to be in these in these next years. And many people would turn against us, you know, family members. Expect the closest people. Um, uh, so to conclude, because I think I've took, <laughs> I've taken a lot of time, I will read Thessalonians 19.
Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophets with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your, may your whole spirit, soul, and body keep, keep, be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and will not do it. And he will, and he will do it. Sorry. Brothers, pray for us. Great, great all, greet all the brothers with, with a holy kiss. I will change you before the Lord before the Lord to have, to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace, the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ will be with you. Even that one explains itself perfectly. Even though pe many people try to say that scripture is not really clear, it's blurry, and they're actually saying this because they want to do whatever they want with it. They want to twist it in the direction they want it to. They want to have this agenda, they have this own thought, and they want to make scripture fit this thought. They don't want to go the other way around. They don't want, to, they want, they don't want scripture to try and they don't want to build a thought off scripture. And um, uh, here, Paul is speaking to the Thessalonian Christians, but we see his implication. We see his eternal impl implication. Um, uh, Paul is letting the... Paul is like saying, you know, the, the spirit in the believers should operate like a car. It is used for, to get from point A to point B if it operates. If, obviously... Everything in the car works properly. The same with every individual in the church. Um, uh, his eternal principle here is basically that we should not care. Paul uses the Spirit's fire, the Spirit's operation in the church. Um, uh, and he answers questions like, why do we come to church, you know, if we have the Bible and we could, you know, read it at home? Why do we come to church if we could, if we have the Bible and we could just read it at home? Is it enough? Rather than um, coming here and being in a community, praising God together, singing songs, um, uh, partaking in meals, you know, um, uh, helping one another, visit one another. Okay, COVID, but you get, you get my, <laughs> my implication. You know, go on mission trips together, have fun, but also be people of obedience in our hearts. It's, a, it's something very important. And Paul, that, that's Paul's implication here. He wants us to gather as a community to have fun, but be people who go hard after God together. Hallelujah. And um, uh, that's my implication for today. So I will pray. Father, we thank you for gathering us here this, 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 um, this Sunday. Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to meet together like this and to be able to, to help one another, to be there for one another and get a message from one another so we could grow in our Christian lives and in the abilities and in the talents that you have, gave, that you have given us um, in the church. Lord, thank you for our spiritual gifts. Thank you for, thank you for um, uh, being active in us, in our hearts. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.